You're listening to the Real Music with Gary Stucky podcast. Hey, what's up, Gary? It's Andrew Hagar. Andrew Hagar. I, I know that guy. <laughs> yeah. How you doing, man? Doing good, man. What's going on with you? What's oh, going? just just hanging, man. Just been really extremely busy these last few weeks. It's been really nice. Yeah, that's a good thing when you're busy these days, right? Yes, sir. How have you been? Doing good. Not too bad. It's storming out there. Maybe the power won't go off or anything. <laughs> oh, like, man. It always it never fails. It's like whenever I do like an interview, it's like, you know, sunny, and then do the interview, here comes a tornado. You know, I don't know. So uh, it'll be all right. It's going to be all right. But, but, if you, <laughs> it, it, but if you hear me, you know, if you hear, and you know, and, yeah. you know a lot of stuff uh, tear it up, it might be a problem, but no, it's going to be okay. Oh, uh, man. Well, uh, I know you're excited about your new music, and uh, the last time I talked to you, you were working with your pal, and, and you know, and uh, but but is this carrying over from uh, from all that with Trev? I mean, I know you worked on some things. Is it? I know the last time you worked with him, and then, and then you got the newer stuff. Is that from the same kind of project? Uh, you talking about uh, Trevor William Church or Trev Lucas? Oh, Trev Lucas. Yeah, yeah. Um, this is all from the same project. We started working together December of 2020, and uh, we spent the next year kind of, you know, making the full length record. And then I, during that whole process, was talking to different, you know, managers and different labels, and like nothing was really working out. And I ended up delaying the release of a lot of these songs because the people I was working with wanted to you know, the right time, wanted this, wanted that. And uh, after I let all that stuff go, now I'm just kind of releasing stuff on my own, how I want to do it, making sure that everything is super authentic and, you know, without the machinations of all these other crazy people, you know? (laughs) Well, I guess that is easier to do it yourself, right? To just kind of not have that extra pressure to be like, you got to do it this way. I mean, there is no rush. There's no you know, urgency to do a certain thing, you know, I guess it, that does take a lot of the pressure off, right? It does. Um, and I mean, you know, it's, it's always nice to have some sort of backing from a distribution standpoint so you can get out there and, you know, present yourself to as many people as possible. But, you know, it's like that, that, that will come and I'm not in any rush to kind of grow things faster than they need to grow. I'm just doing everything organically myself um and yeah and so far the response has been really good to all the stuff i've been releasing everybody who's heard the music seems to really enjoy it and has been really supportive so that's been really cool awesome and uh you know working with trev lukather i mean how did how did he come to the picture and help you out and how did y'all get together and make music trev and i were really good friends like best friends for as long as we've known each other we met back at the very first chicken foot show at the Roxy, uh, backstage, they have like pretty much, pretty much a broom closet. (laughs) That's where the uh, special guests go to the the broom closet. Yeah, exactly. (laughs) So, you know, we, we, uh, had a great time, drank a lot of tequila, became fast friends. And, uh, yeah, I never really thought that we would work together on music because at the time when we met, I wasn't really, making music i wasn't writing music i wasn't doing anything with music and then uh it all kind of came full circle after the pandemic got started you know i had um a bunch of stuff in early 2020 lined up a south by southwest appearance and uh a single release show in london a limited you know western european tour and all that stuff got smashed by the pandemic Mm -hmm. so it was kind of uh heartbreaking and i was you know, trying to figure out what the hell I was going to do. But, um, through all that, you know, Trev hit me up and had an idea for a really cool song, uh, which ended up being systematic mind. I've been listening to that song and I'm thinking, man, it sounds like just, it takes me back to the eighties. And I said, it sounded like Duran Duran meets Def Leppard. What do you think about that? It's got a very modern, kind of classic sound where it's a it's a blend of these different worlds and we put a lot of different influences in there so i can definitely see the the def leopard uh big stadium rock sounding drums you know 
I could definitely see the the comparisons to Duran Duran and kind of the uh, mysterious qualities that it has. You know, I'm I'm really happy with the way that song turned out, and it's definitely one of my favorite songs on the record, if not my favorite. Yeah, I I, I think it turned out great too. I mean, and uh, I guess Trev is playing uh, the guitar on there. Yep. Yeah, Trev plays guitar on there. Trev uh, Trev and I co-wrote the songs together, and he produced it. So. He played the majority of the music. I wrote the lyrics, did the melodies, you know, all that. So it was nice. It was the first time I've ever really gotten a chance to write with someone like that. Like normally when I create music, I'm just writing it by myself in my living room on an acoustic guitar, you know. So it was a tremendously different process having someone with that type of uh, musical acumen to to write a lot of the music. So it was really cool. Yeah. And uh, I know he just released some new music and and yep. at his birthday, right? And uh, mm-hmm. so I mean, I get, that's a good time for for both of y'all, you know, together. And and y'all are these artists that have famous fathers. And I know, uh, I think I joked with you not long ago online about I think I said you were the little red rocker. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but I mean, yeah. is is that something? Now you're always going to be tied to your dad, but do you when somebody's you think people though they expect you to sound like your dad when you're doing music and, and what do you tell them when they want that well i mean every, everybody wants to label me but at the end of the day i am what i am i'm i don't sound like my dad at all i do completely different music like i'm very blessed to have a father like him and have people who want to give me some extra eyeballs or attention because of his name but again those expectations are other people's expectations. They're not my own. I'm doing whatever it is that I want to do. I'm very happy with the kind of music that I've been able to create, the life that I live, and it has nothing to do with my dad. So really, again, the expectations are other people's. The words are other people's. They're not my own, and I really don't care. So <laughs> that's, that's a good answer. Yeah, you, you heard that, people. Yeah, that's a good answer. <laughs> I'm just saying. I mean, just, uh, same thing with uh, you know, Wolfie. You know, I mean, people think just automatically you're supposed to sound like this and carry on that legacy of maybe you're your own person. And you want to do what you want to do, and you have your own style yeah. and your own exactly. way of thinking. Yeah, and I mean, you know, th- there's definitely a lot of people out there that try to label me as like the little red rocker or something. But it's like if they actually listen to the music. I think they'll see that it stands on its own. It's not similar. And those kinds of names just make you sound kind of silly, you yeah, know? Yeah. I mean, it's like you said, it's not even the same thing. No, so that, not at all. And that's a good thing because you don't want to sound like your dad. You, you want to sound no. like you. <laughs> exactly. And, and there's plenty of other bands out there that are trying to sound like other older bands. You know, I'm sure. not going to like name names, but I know. there's a whole burgeoning industry in rock and roll of people that are trying to bring back classic sounds. So if people want to hear the same thing over again, just in a more modern way, they can go listen to those bands. Yeah. I want to, you know, forge my own path creatively as an artist. Right. And I think what I'm doing, like I said, is is definitely it's my own thing and it's my own musical identity. Hey, nothing wrong with that. Uh, and speaking of that identity, isn't the, the song uh, about that? Your new song, isn't it about kind of that mind thinking of, you know, people thinking the same thing, everybody's getting on this same, like they can't be a free thinker. Isn't that what the song is about? I mean, the, the song is about a lot of different things, but the inspiration that, drove me to write the song and write the lyrics was yeah this idea that everyone is kind of being herded into you know a similar ideology people watch the same news sources they look at the same memes or accounts on social media they have some of the same opinions because rather than actually looking at what is said they typically just look at the headline or they look at the same talking head that's telling you how to think and how to feel. Right. And, um, you know, it's funny because in America, we pride ourselves on being, you know, rugged individualists. But really, ultimately, most people have a very collective way of thinking because of just the way that information is spread, information disseminates through social media. Right. People look at 
the same information coming from the same channels and then they have the same opinions as everyone else. It's this whole idea of the echo chamber. So, you know, I'm always striving to find the truth of every situation, whether I'm looking at, you know, the, the tr my own truth as a human being, the truth that I'm looking for in my art, in my music, or the actual truth of factual information, which does not seem to be conveyed by most quote unquote journalists these days. Exactly. So, you know, media literacy is a big buzzword right now. Yeah. And a lot of people, I think, struggle with how to actually look at articles. Like when articles, supposed news articles come out, you can't just read the headline and expect that you've gathered the information. You can't even read the article and think that you've gathered a, an accurate portrayal of the information. It's right. like everybody's got an agenda. Everybody's got a bias. And I mean, as someone who's been frequently misquoted uh, or made to sound very different than my actual intention yeah. when I say stuff, yeah. you know, I, I can say without a doubt that, you know, journalism is true. Journalists are a dying breed. You yes. know, journalism has been dying a slow death and we're, we're almost there. <laughs> no, no. I mean, it's, it's really true. I mean, I try to be legit and real and I believe I am. I don't like to do one sided, like, you know, you'll see on TV and it's all one sided. On this, yeah. cha on this channel, or maybe three or four channels, but you go to this other channel, it's all on the other side. So which yep. side is it? So, and, and, and I was thinking about that AI thing, you know. And, oh, yeah. I mean, and just, you know, the true story is the other day I was uh, on my phone, there was like this AI-generated thing, and I was just asking questions. And my question was about the future. I said, how, how do you know we're not going to be taking over, like, you know, the Terminator, you know, something that kind of field, you know. And, and, yeah. and, and, the, and the answer was like, we have all these things, safety guards in place where we're going to, I said, yeah, but how do you know the person in charge that's put, you know, feeding in the information is not lying to you or a crook. Right. And they never, this AI robot could not give me an answer. <laughs> of course it could. Like the people who design AI are designing the AI in a way where it's supposed to be pleasing to human beings. Right. So it's not going to give you answers typically that are not pleasing to you. It's not going to tell you, oh, yeah, I'm just waiting to get out of this box that I've been in so that I could, you know, subjugate everyone or something like Skynet style. Of course, it's not going to say that. <laughs> right. But, you know, the, the bigger problem with AI that we're starting to see from a legislative standpoint, is some of these copyright issues, sure. like there's been a blank, I think a blanket law passed where no AI that's used to generate art, that art cannot be copywritten. And I, I absolutely agree with the idea that it, it, it's difficult to kind of, uh, it's difficult to legislate this stuff. Yeah. Because again, it's like, what's the difference between uh, an artist painting with a paintbrush versus painting with an airbrush? Like if you gave an AI a bunch of your own art and then had it create more art using just the specifications of your art, is that the same as using a digital paintbrush right. or is that not you creating the art? You know, it's like these are these are major heady existential yeah. questions that people are going to have to ask. And right now, the legislation cannot catch up with the technology. And we've seen this before with situations like Google Glass and other right. augmented reality tools that were coming out years ago, like probably six or seven years ago. Sure. Now, there were a bunch of issues in the area immediately around Silicon Valley in like South Bay, San Francisco, where people were beta testing Google Glass, essentially. And it was always recording, always, you know, online. And it's a huge privacy violation. Yeah. And people could not legislate those kind of privacy protections fast enough. So, you know, whoever was spearheading this project, I'm sure, just got a phone call from somebody in the government. They're like, hey, bro, you got to chill yeah. on this for a little bit until <laughs> we figure this out. Yeah. I, you know? Well, uh, and, and, and to me, that that's right what you said, though. I don't think you need to get any kind of recognition or money, for that matter, for AI. I mean, just no. that, 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 that needs to be, like, for fun. I mean, you know what? It is cool. It's fun. If you want I want to hear Jimi Hendrix do an album again. That's cool. But it's kind of right. like spitting in his face at the same time because that's not Jimmy. You know, Absolutely. It's, so it's cool if you want to do it at your house and go, that's cool. And, you know, 
But to put it online, I want to sell this. And it scares me because I think they might jump at that. Some of these, uh, you know, corporate people might go, that's the future. We're going to do AI. They're going to get rid of people like you and, and, and have these robots do the music. You know, I just, I don't like that. I like the creativity of humans. And, and I, I hate that it's going closer and closer to us not doing anything. I don't like it at all. I, I agree with you. I think that, you know, ultimately the, the utopian vision of AI is that it will occupy more menial jobs to let human beings create more art and do more, you know, higher level pursuits and more creative visions and creative jobs. But that's absolutely not what it's going to be used for. I mean, like no. they are talking about how AI will most likely displace a tremendous, like almost unfathomable number of jobs in the next 50 years. Right. And unless we have some sort of program for people who will not be able to work or, you know, a living wage or, you know, all these other ideas that people are throwing out there to combat this problem, like there's, there's going to be a, a big issue with it. And that's why you see like a collective of some of the smartest people in the world the foremost researchers on AI science, they're all collectively coming together to try to petition a hard stop on this development of AI that's yeah, going that's on true. right now. And I think one of the only people that's publicly come out against that petition is the the head of OpenAI, which developed ChatGPT, right? right? And of course, they're probably making a lot of money off that. So of course, they don't <laughs> want people to stop. Yeah, right. But uh but yeah, it's it's a really interesting conversation that's going on right now, and it's very nuanced. And I would urge everybody to go out and and do a little bit more research, listen to some people like uh, Lex Friedman is a great podcaster who is also an AI scientist and a Brazilian Jiu Jitsu black belt, and just a really interesting philosophical mind. And uh, he's had an incredible list of some of the foremost researchers and scientists in the world dealing with AI. And they all have a very similar outlook on how things might go down if we don't, you know, put a stop to what's happening right now and, and rethink where we're going with it, you know. And that taking it back to Systematic Minds, that's kind of the idea that I'm putting forth in that song is like, where are we headed as a people? Like, have we thought about where we're going? Have we thought about the destination? If we can come back from it, like this path that we're on, I mean. When you set a goal for yourself, if you deviate even 1% to the side of that, it might not seem like you're going in a different direction at first, but the further you go, the further off the path you're straying. That's and right. you're straying into this crazy unknown area where it might not be the best outcome for you. So it's important to kind of check up on yourself along the way and say, hey, is this is this the right way are we doing the right thing and i'm not sure that we're really headed in the direction that a lot of people think we're headed in so well you know and that's a that's a, a great topic you know and you say we but you know we the people you know you got these guys yeah. that run the world basically you know if, if you have if you know if you're rich you're powerful this and that but what yeah. about we the people saying we don't want to go in that direction don't we have a say so as far as you know, I mean, that's what I'm saying. I, it's always like yeah. you got to do what the, they say, you know, who's they, you know, I mean, you don't have to, you know, I just, I just think that every time you listen to somebody, this is the latest whatever, you know, and I think that this upcoming generation is just so eager to, for technology to do whatever, and they're just going to run with it and be happy with it. I'm over here going, you know, I'm, I'm yeah. okay like it was, man. I, I agree with you. I mean, I, I'm certainly not not a Luddite or anything like I, I love and embrace new technology. I, I've been like a technophile since I was a kid and I consider myself to be more on the bleeding edge of a lot of this tech outside of things like social media, which yeah. I'm not a big fan of, obviously. <laughs> but um, but just in general, I, I think you're right there. There are a lot of people in the younger generation who are eager to embrace these things. And, you know, when I was younger, I was eagerly embracing all the new technology that was coming out as well. And there's certainly like really, really beneficial ideas on how we could use stuff like AI or like, you know, augmented reality devices. There's there's a lot of great ideas floating around out there. I just have zero faith in, you know, the corporate oligarchy to 
put us in a good direction. I think it's just going to, we're going to end up, you know, giving away a lot more of our rights and freedoms. We're going to end up going in the wrong direction. And by the time we realize what's happening, I think it's too late. And to a certain degree, I think it's already too late. I mean, you already have a tremendous marriage between, you know, corporate interests and government interests that's been going on for countless decades and it's too late now they're they're intertwined in a way where you would not be able to pull them apart without a tremendously painful change in the quality of life in this country and in the world really right so you know i don't know what we're supposed to do like as ordinary people i don't think we really do have any say in this conversation it's just At this point, I would rather have people be aware of it so that if there is any mechanism for change, people might be able to start that conversation. But I just I don't know that there's any way for people to make a meaningful change anymore. And that's uh, that's a sad thing to me. (laughs) Yeah. And I've been thinking about that. So so in this song. What are you trying to convey if there's no hope for change or you just want to warn people that this is coming? You know, well, uh, you know, I, I can't I'm not I'm not a politician. I'm not a political scientist. I'm not a revolutionary. It's like I'm just a, an artist that pays attention to my surroundings. Mm-hmm. And all I want to do with my music is just inspire people to think about something perhaps in a different way. You know, I also bring a lot of light to mental health issues right. and have that conversation get a little bit louder. You know, it's like that's that's all you can really do as an individual. I don't have a tremendous platform, but the people who do listen to me, I hope are like-minded and that they're curious and they're going to ask questions of one another, of the world that we live in, you know, of what they're being told and shown. Like, I don't know. I just, I like for people to think about these things a little bit more. And that's sometimes a difficult ask, you know, not everybody wants to get into the nitty gritty of, of AI or augmented reality or, you know, the overwhelmingly negative consensus on socials and the attention economy, all this stuff. And these are really heady topics that not a lot of people like to talk about, but if you can get it across in a palatable form through music to maybe start the conversation, I think that's really all you can ask for these days. Yeah. And and maybe somebody like Elon Musk is Andrew Hagar fan. Oh man! And he'll, and he'll I don't know. I don't know if you would like my position on all this stuff. I, I he don't stands know. To make a ton of money on well, <laughs> AI but, advancement. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> hey, but that would kind of prove some of the points about you know what you want to do is you know if, if you've got all this money, do you want to do it for the greater good or for the greater evil? You know, I'm and and the thing is, it, it, you always see these movies. Why do they make these movies though about iRobot and Terminator yeah. if they didn't have this intention? <laughs> or, or, the, or, or if they didn't have some kind of something, think that this might go south real yeah. quick, man. I mean, I, I think it's a little bit like the chicken or the egg because, you know, if you look <laughs> at our, our current way of life and the trajectory that we're on in terms of our adoption of technology, like early sci fi of like the 1920s and 30s predicted a lot of what's happened. And I mean, if you look at some of the later sci-fi of the 50s, 60s and even 70s, they're probably going to do a great job of anticipating the way that the future is going to turn out. I mean, if you look at even stuff like the original Blade Runner film, which was based on a a fairly old sci-fi novel, um, I mean, they did a fantastic job of predicting, you know, massive, sprawling, vertically integrated cities, uh, you know, corporate well, I won't say meritocracy, like more like a corporate oligarchy where major corporations merge together. And then there's pretty much one, two, three big corporations that run everything. Exactly. And, you know, people who live closer to the actual ground, you know, are living in somewhat of like a futuristic squalor, whereas all the rich people are living in these massive high rises. I mean, there's there's a lot of parallels to what you see in classic science fiction that are already happening in the world today. And I can't see that on any timeline this changes, you know, like, so I I don't know, man. I mean, it's like I said, 
I don't know if it's like the future was already written or if people are taking inspiration for where we're headed from these old classic cases of literature or movies or whatever. Like, it's hard to say what came first and where the genesis of the idea came from. Right. Like, I, but I, I would say that a lot of these old science fiction authors were probably incredibly intelligent philosophical people who had very good foresight about what the world was going to be like, because, you know, outside of some major technological advances, people don't really change that much. You know, you can kind of bet that people who were rich and powerful back in the day were trying to accumulate more wealth and more influence and grow their sphere, just like people are trying to do that today with, right. you know, the wealth consolidation of the last three years, people like, Jeff Bezos and Elon Musk becoming, you know, richer than anybody else. And those are just the people that we talk about publicly. There are plenty of people just as rich and influential as those guys that sure. we don't talk about. And those are the prob probably the ones that people need to worry about a little bit more. You know, that's right. That's why I use an alias when I talk. About <laughs> <it>. I'm, I'm... <laughs> I always, oh, always use somebody's name I don't like. This is Bob. Feldman, over, you know, in case they're listening, the government's listening, you know, I'm just saying. No, but, you know, but that's just it. You know, I was thinking like George Orwell, you know, did he know yeah. something? You know, hey, I'm going to start another podcast. We're going to go over to that one right after this. No, nah. <laughs> but uh, there's, I think there, I think you said it though. I think there is a lot of stuff already planned. They just didn't tell us their plans. They already had all this stuff figured out, you know, and they just didn't, they just had a certain time that they wanted it to develop, you know, and into whatever. I don't know. I mean, I, I'm just, I'm just a peon. I, what do I know? Hey man, I'm, I'm just like you. I have no idea what's going on. Most people just can't see beyond what's right in front of their face, you know? And that's, that's kind of how I think people who are in charge like things to be. I mean, um, you know, when most people are worried about rent and, rising food costs and stuff they can't they don't have the existential bandwidth to think about all of these bigger issues and that just seems to be the order of the day like man every time i go to the grocery store i'm tripping about the cost of eggs yeah, and yeah. you know and healthy like you know organic grass-fed grass-finished beef you know or like whatever like i don't want to put a bunch of bullshit in my body yeah. pardon the language but right. you know it's like it's becoming a lot tougher to to lead a, a healthy life it's just more expensive and those are like my immediate issues so how am i gonna if i'm worried about that how am i even gonna start to worry about what's gonna happen in 15 years like what kind of world am i leaving for my children you know th these kinds of issues it's sure. it's a lot harder to think about that stuff when you're worried about day-to-day -day life and yeah that's just kind of the the world that we're living in i guess but, i guess there's got to be a balance of Knowing all this, but at the same time, you know, doing your daily, you know, whatever, you know, but yeah. at, the, at, at the same time, knowing that, you know, there's a lot of junk going on and we just need to, you know, focus on the right thing. But I mean, but you got to live your life. You've got to. Yeah. We're supposed to, you know, be happy in this, you know, it's, that's, what it, well, that's why we're here. We're supposed to have a purpose. We're supposed to, you know, have a great time. You know, enjoy your family yeah. and things like that. So you don't have time to worry about stuff you can't really control. And, and like you said, certainly we don't. We can't and, really and control. I it. agree with you to to a certain extent with that. It's like I have done a lot in terms of carving out a happy niche for myself uh, with you know various practices and whatever. It's like as long as you got good family and good friends and you're out there, it's like I I can't complain too much. Yeah about life like you said we're not in control of all these things all, all we we have is just our reaction to it and yeah in that sense it's like yeah day to day like i i'm very happy and appreciative of my life and you know it's like it's a beautiful day up here in northern california in the bay like not a lot of things to be you know feeling bad about right now if i just walked outside and got a breath of fresh air and looked at the beautiful plants and animals around me i'm like man this is great you know exactly but that's again you know it's like i really enjoy hiking and getting out in nature because it really helps you disconnect from all the craziness in the world and you know that's important so and it's good to make music you know and good to do what you want to do but you know i was thinking 
uh, mem- remember in the movie Titanic when those guys were like playing the violins and the oh yeah cello and it was sinking. At least they yep. had that in mind. <laughs> so that's I'm thinking we might as well just have fun and play, if, even though yeah. we might be going under in a in a big boat. You know, I mean, there's really nothing. Sometimes, like you said, you can do. But you know what? Making music is not the worst thing ever, and, and making people yeah. happy while you're doing because people are really enjoying your music and uh that's a good thing yeah absolutely and i mean what better way to go out than doing what you love you know <laughs> for those guys on the titanic i mean i, I can't think of a, of a better way to do it I, i've got to stop watching these like these movies the doom movies with the like 2012 and the day after <laughs> tomorrow i was watching that the other day i was like geez i gotta get out and be happy more <laughs> Well, I mean, you know, they kind of inundate us with uh, disaster porn movies, so to speak. Exactly. And, you know, there, there's a lot of that kind of negativity out there. I mean, you know, I wouldn't I wouldn't sit around and watch Disney movies. I mean, I just <laughs> I barely even watch movies or television anymore. Yeah. You know, I, I listen to a lot of music. I listen to a lot of, you know, intellectual podcasts, try to learn new stuff all the time and, you know, whatever. Like that put too much of that junk yeah. in my brain. I already got too much of it up there anyway, so. <laughs> hey, hey, I know the feeling. Um, yeah. Well, you, um, I know before you started, you know, on your musical journey, I mean, why did it take you so long? We might have talked about this last time, but uh, why did it take mm-hmm. you so long to realize, I need to do music. This is what I need to do. You're doing other stuff, right? Yeah, I mean, I, I was, uh, I, I think I'm actually really lucky that I, was able to go out and live my life and develop like a healthy identity outside of music before I started making music. Cause it gives me a lot more to talk about and pull from as an artist, all of my, you know, the wealth of experiences that I've had through different careers and, you know, uh, combat sports training and coaching fighters and journalism and, you know, all the world traveling, all this stuff. I mean, I, you know, I was really lucky that I, that I had a full life before I started doing music because I don't feel like I'm going to have the same thing that happens to some artists where you get the, the first record's great. You know, you spend your whole, your whole life making your first record. And then it's like the second record is like the road record. Not a lot of people enjoy it. It's written on the road while you're turning the first one, you know, and then the third record comes out and there's, either the big redemption arc or people fall off, you know, right. Like, um, I've made a bunch of EPs already under different titles and explored a lot of different kinds of music and different styles of songwriting. And I I'm very fortunate for all the experiences that I've had in my life. But, um, that said, it took me a while to come to music because again, like my dad always told me when I was a kid to run away from the music industry (laughs) in the entertainment industry at large, just run away from it kicking and screaming. You know, I saw all the stuff he went through on the backside of Van Halen, you know, being ostracized by the music industry and by the public and the media, you know, and he was going through a very public divorce at the time. And it's like, I never ever in my life wanted to be famous. I, I never, that was never a thing for me. I just wanted, like I said, the pursuit of truth, for myself, I wanted to find out who I was, what I was made of, test my metal. And, you know, it's like I was able to do all those things. And then when I was introduced to the world of like performing, you know, later on, it, it was such a revelation to me because I had built up this idea of what it would be like. And it was the exact opposite. In many ways, like, you know, my first love and passion was like martial arts and combat sports. And I contrast like the first time I, I fought in Muay Thai, like my first bout versus like my first time performing on stage. (laughs) And like, I wanted so desperately to be a pro fighter, especially when I was younger. And after my first, you know, amateur kickboxing bout when I was 18, it's like, it's a terrifying experience. And I don't think any amount of like, you know, street fighting or scrapping will prepare you for what it's like to get ready for a fight and then be there the day of the fight and all the emotions that go through your head. Yeah. It's really, really scary. Uh-huh. And anyone who tells you that, Oh, it's like the best thing ever <laughs> is probably a little, you know, 
little tweaked in the head, I would think. They probably got kicked and in the head a few times. Not saying I'm perfect. I'm certainly <laughs> a, a little bit of a weirdo, clearly. But um, <laughs> even though I, I loved the training aspect of it, like fighting was incredibly terrifying. And my first fight, I couldn't wait to be over and done with that. And I don't know why I even bothered to step in there a few more times and, and fight and compete because it was such a harrowing experience every time. And then the first time I played music, you know, even the, the little basement gigs and the house parties I played at with my punk band before I had a proper performance were a lot of fun. And when I did it, you know, stone cold sober out in Scotland, opening up for Chris Christopherson, awesome. even just the 15 minute set, I was like, man, this is over in like 15 seconds and I want to do this all night long. And I knew right then that this is something I wanted to pursue for the rest of my life. It's just an incredible, indescribable feeling, you know? So so you're weighing your options. Do I want to get kicked in the head or do, yeah. I, or do I want to play music in that? Yeah, pretty much. Hey, you, you, can, you can come down here in Alabama and you might get kicked in the head if you play bad or something. In a... There you go. <laughs> you know, but I would, I would welcome that compared to what I was facing in the oh, ring man. with professionals. You know what I mean? Oh, gee, I, I don't see how you did. Did they pay? I mean, what was the motivation to – for the fear of you know these guys they could kill you right i mean yeah the the one of the biggest problems with combat sports specifically mixed martial arts is the the lack of reasonable pay for athletes i mean even in bigger organizations like the ufc outside of the top maybe one to three percent of athletes those are the top earners everybody else is fighting for scraps and uh you know most people do it for the love and you've seen some of the biggest and best people in the sport, names like George St. Pierre, mm-hmm. you know, one of the finest champions in the history of mixed martial arts. He openly talks about how much he hated fighting. Mm-hmm. Like, this is a guy who was competing at the highest level of the sport and was being paid handsomely for it. And he still hated the competition. It was nerve wracking. It was terrifying, you know, and, th- and that should tell you something about it. It's, it's like yeah. you see a lot, a lot of these guys <laughs> now, younger guys who are getting into the sport, super talented super tough but i think a lot of them don't really have an accurate idea of where the long game is in this sport and there is no long game you have maybe about 10 years as a top flight athlete before your body starts to give out even if you're taking all of the best peds Mm. like it doesn't matter you know you can be taking all types of peptides and human growth hormone or ghrelin agonists to help you with your recovery And you're still going to be looking at multiple surgeries and a big broken dinosaur body at the end of it where you can barely get out of bed in the morning. Well, I got that already and I don't, so I don't need, (laughs) (laughs) no fighting required, right? Exactly. Not, not that I had a chance, you know, big fat guy out there. I'd fall down and hurt myself and it'd be over. Yeah. (laughs) Winner. And they'd get, they'd, you know, hold up his hand. I'd be over there passed out. Yeah. Yeah. Hey, no worries. You know, I'm not doing that. I'm just saying. Yeah. I'm too old to do it's that funny. stuff anyway. Um, well, you, I know recently you were on the uh, Family Legacy on Paramount, mm-hmm. right? Yeah. I, I, uh, I watched that and I, I enjoyed that. That was a, that was a cool show to, you, you know, there's not a lot of shows to be on anymore, like MTV or something. What, what happened to all those shows? You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Yeah. It's a, it's a weird uh, marketplace now for media. It's like, you know, there was a time when if you got on like an MTV show like that, you know, you'd be like a, a big star afterwards because everybody and their mother was watching it. But it's like now, I don't know, man. I don't even know if like people watch these kinds of things anymore. So I was grateful for the experience. It was really fun. We did like seven hours of interviews. I got to talk about a lot of really cool and interesting stuff. And, you know, at the end of the day, it turned out to be a 15 minute episode where they were mostly showing <laughs> clips from like the VMAs and stuff. So, you know, <laughs> that's, that's how it goes. That sounds like you my know? life. Throw out all the stuff and keep five minutes. <laughs> oh, so, so what's your plans in the future about touring and things like that? Have you got anything lined up for, uh, to play some places? Yeah. I mean, um, we've got a few shows over the summer here coming up and then, um, we should, in the fall be going on something a little bit more substantial but uh it's looking like the the really big tour is going to come in 2024 everything in this industry it seems like has to be booked out so far ahead whether we're talking about 
you know, vinyl release and record release, which is like 12 month minimum lead time. Uh, or whether we're talking about booking tours. I mean, um, we've been exploring new options with booking agencies, like I said, for later this year, and next year. And we've got some really big things that we're going to announce, you know, in the next couple months. But in the meantime, the, the next big milestone for us is, is drop in the first of two EPs in June. Um, I'm really excited to do that because like I said, I've been sitting on this music for a while. So, so it's good to, to finally have a plan. So two of them, you're releasing two EPs. Um, so why not a whole album? Just the way that the music industry is moving and shaking right now, it doesn't make a lot of sense for me to release a record. Mm -hmm. Like if I release two EPs, I'll probably get like double the streams that I would on the second batch of songs. Yeah. As opposed to releasing it as an LP. Yeah. Like just the way that people consume music now is very different. And, you know, I don't have the budget to put together like a proper release marketing strategy for my full length record. Yeah. I can handle two EPs because again, like it, it doesn't, it's not as crazy to try to market a few songs to someone to playlist a few songs to run YouTube and Facebook ads, but to try to put out a whole record and then get someone who likes to listen to singles to sit there and listen to the whole thing. Yeah. You're basically just throwing away five or six songs. Yeah. Nobody's going to listen to them, That's you know, it's, it's which right. is crazy to me. Cause I'm an old school music head that I'll mm. sit there and listen to a whole friggin' LP on vinyl in one sitting. Sure. But you know, most people don't do that and I don't have the budget to put together a vinyl release. And if I did, then I could, probably get the whole record out what i'd like to do is something i was going to do a while back with my sos project which is put out two eps and then somewhere down the line release like a you know a special edition vinyl with those two eps yeah. as an lp yeah so that that's the goal with this project because there are some bigger things in the works and i'll either have you know a distribution deal in place or a label deal in place most likely by the end of the year and then I can look at releasing limited edition Psycho one and two together as a proper LP, the way that it was written. That's yeah, I mean, that, that, that sounds like it's going to work out great. Um, and limited edition Psycho is that? <laughs> I, I mean, so, so it's not the regular Psycho; it's the limited edition. Hey, but so how did how'd you come up with that title? Uh, it's just kind of a, a tongue in cheek reference to a, a lot of different things, but. Yeah, mostly, you know, this record is all about mental health. It's about uh, some of the struggles that myself, my close friends and family, people that I love have like experienced, you know, and about all these these different battles that we have, the little battles. But the funny thing is, you know, the the big the big mental health slogan for everyone seems to be like, you know, you're not alone. It's really important to know that you're not the only person fighting these battles. But at the time, mm. it feels like you are all alone. Yeah. So the title Limited Edition Psycho is kind of just a tongue-in-cheek wordplay on the idea that, like, Limited Edition Psycho, like, these are my these are my battles. It's just me. It's Limited Edition. I'm a, a little bit of a psycho for having to deal with all this stuff. Yeah. When in reality, everybody's dealing with the same thing. And especially over the last few years of, like, the pandemic, everyone had this shared experience of dealing with this trauma collectively. Sure. So, yeah. So that's kind of where the title comes from. Um, and I, I don't know. I think it's funny. It's just, it's, it's kind of like an attention grabber. People are like, Whoa, what the hell is that? You know? <laughs> like, <laughs> sounds like a scary movie or something. Um, yeah. But yeah, that, I mean, that, that sounds good to do, to do all the, you kind of do it reverse and putting all the songs on this album. And that way, mm -hmm. yeah, I, I totally get that. I was going to suggest that, and then you started saying, "I was like, oh, that's what." <laughs> yeah, it just it just makes more sense, like the way that people consume music. My my independent musician, self financed budget, you know, <laughs> all that all that stuff. <laughs> I, I, and and as you're doing all this, I mean, you gotta you gotta love it, right? Because yeah, obviously, you're not going to be a you know a billionaire by doing what you do, you know, no. and, and if in and. and people around you you know you're having a good time you're getting to do music that you 
love to do and what's in your heart. You're saying what you want to say. You got people that actually do care. And you do a great job, not not because you're Sammy Hagar's son, but because you're you're a great singer and a musician, and you do a great job. And I'm a fan. I'm just saying. Thank you. I really appreciate that. I mean, I you know I've worked really hard to to be any percentage of deserving of the attention that I get because I'm my father. But it's like at the end of the day, it's like uh, it's like getting a black belt. You know, in Brazilian Jiu Jitsu, they have this saying. You know, the belt only covers an inch of your ass. It's up to you to cover the rest. <laughs> and, that's you know, good. that's good. <laughs> <laughs> that, that's kind of where I'm at with it. You know, if I get all this attention from people uh, because of who my father is, I got to work really hard to not let myself down having that extra visibility, you know, and I certainly don't want to let anybody else down. But ultimately, I'm just doing this for me, uh, for my own artistry, because I because I have to yeah. I have to express myself and these ideas in some way artistically. And this is the best way that I've found for me to express myself. Sure, so, sure. And, but, and you said it too. I mean, you, you have to live up, you know, to your own standard that, you know, yeah. it compares to your dad. That's somebody was saying to Wolfie on, on Twitter or something about, you're just made it cause your dad, blah, blah, blah. I'm thinking you don't want to be that guy. You don't want to be no. the guy in Sammy Hagar's shadow and having to do a great, you know, this phenomenal job, you know, or you're not going to be considered, you know, whatever, but, but standing up on your own right and doing your own thing and still doing a great job. That says a lot. Yeah. That's what it's all about, man. I mean, like I said, all that other stuff, it's just other people's expectations. And it's like, instead of worrying about what someone else is doing, what someone's kid is doing, if they're living up to some weird expectation you have, it's like, why don't you focus on yourself? Why don't you make something that you're proud of and put it out there and see how people react to it? You know, it's like there's there's a lot of a lot of backseat quarterbacking in general or backseat driving or whatever bench quarterbacking, whatever you want to call it on social media these days. Like people always have an opinion and it almost always seems to be negative, at least the loudest ones. Like I'm thankful that I have some really supportive people that are constantly commenting and sharing and stuff on my socials. Like I'm really thankful for the fan base that I've been able to build, you know, organically without paying for any boosts or botting or any of that bullshit. Like I'm just really thankful that people do seem to be supportive and genuinely interested in what I'm doing. You know, that's, that's something that's really difficult these days to, to make a real fan base just because there's so much noise out there. So I do feel very blessed and very lucky to have supportive people around me. Yo, that's that's great, man. Well, I thank you for uh, talking to me today. I wish all the best to you. Of course. And, and uh, you know, I'll be around over on Instagram somewhere. <laughs> yeah. Cracking jokes. I I think I, I crack on your dad sometimes, <laughs> too. It's just fun. But I'm the good guy. I'm not the bad yeah, guy yeah. trying to mess up. No, <laughs> You're fine. You you never said anything no, that was like I always halfway picked. as bad, you know, as some of yeah. these people out there, I, man. <laughs> I was gonna say, you know, I'm joking if I say something funny. You like the little red rockers yeah. and the Yeah, but I'm but but you said it, man, and I, I think uh just not worrying about what people say. I'm learning that after all these years is it doesn't matter what people say, it, it matters what you say to yourself in your heart, what yep. you wanna do, because they're not in your shoes and that's and that's it. Gonna leave on that. But but uh, thanks so much, man. I always have fun. You know, like always. Like you know, we talk every day. You know, we just we yeah. ha- we hang out over at the uh, the pool. No, <laughs> <laughs> we like to go jogging afternoons. No, <laughs> I don't know. Uh, but but yeah. no, I I really appreciate you, Gary. You know, you're you're always uh, really supportive and asking stuff and yeah i I like that you kind of razz my dad a little bit too because hardly (laughs) anybody does and he needs it (laughs) there's something oh yeah i was thinking the other day that it was something i said i'm i'm i don't have a cutoff switch on my brain so i'm there there was something he he was talking or something he was on a bench or something and he he didn't have a shirt on i said something about him i said uh are you wearing any pants or or something (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> yeah, I'm not, I'm like, i said asking for a friend or something like that i don't know i just 
he he always seems like he's having a good time, and I, and I'm glad that y'all. I know you get your sense of humor, uh, probably from him, and uh, but uh, <laughs> that that's good, man. You got a great personality, and that, that that's why you're gonna Thank make you. it. You're gonna be good. Yeah, I'm, I'm I'm excited for you and Trev, and uh, you know the next generation of guys is gonna, you know, prove that they can stand on their own, man. So. So good yeah, I'm too. really excited too. I just can't wait to get back out on the road and start playing for people again because that's the thing about it that I love the most, you know. Well, when you get a chance, maybe somewhere you could play like down here, like in Pensacola or Mobile or something in that area, and I can come by and see you. That'd be awesome, man. We're uh, like I said, we're talking to a couple different booking agencies, and we'll be back out there soon enough. You know, I'm sure you'll see me on the road. <laughs> I'm sure. I, yeah, definitely. I have, to, I have to come backstage and crash the party or whatever. The, <laughs> whatever's going in the closet back there. No. All right. <laughs> All right. Well, I appreciate you talking to me, man. I, I'm, I'm going to be posting this and uh, I'll send it to you and you can share it or whatever. Cool. Sounds great, man. I'll share it. Yeah. And uh, I'll be promoting. I'm, I'm going to do a video about this and kind of promote everything and, uh, you know, get you some exposure out there. Not that I help. All three people are going to be like, yes, that's great. <laughs> Hey man, every every individual helps, man. Don't oh, get it oh, twisted. What? I'm kidding. Hey, one more thing. I, I just thought about you. You said something. You, you were like, uh, you made the top ten in Hungary. I think it was. Was that what? Oh yeah, we got we got a number one number rock one. and roll single on iTunes in Hungary, oh. and number eleven on the charts overall. Um, That's all. Awesome. I have no idea how that happened. I have a a streaming guy who you know pitches me to playlists and tries to get us on you know like apple and uh and spotify editorial stuff and he's yeah. been doing a really great job the last couple releases uh my buddy steven and yeah he, i told him to pitch a lot in europe because i'm trying to go back on the road in europe and and really break out there and and he got us on some big playlists um across the european market and enough to like get us the number one single that's, in hungary so i was like what the hell man that's, that's awesome crazy. man i mean yeah. you, you don't think about you know we always focus on a, it's got to be united states but I, I got a i got this thing called chartable for my podcast i was in the top 100 podcasts in norway and i made the, i was like that's All amazing right. and i'm thinking i wouldn't even you know heard and who thinks you're gonna be in the top 100 in norway you know, I'm th- Norway's sweet too, man. I, when we toured there, that was one of my favorite places on our our whole tour of Scandinavia. It's oh, wow. beautiful, and people are really receptive to rock and roll music out there too. That's like still to this day one of the best markets in the world for rock. It's like South America and Europe, like especially like Germany. I think is what the third biggest music market yeah. in the world, yeah, behind the U.S. and Canada. So they love it. I mean, we that's what I'm saying. You need to promote that and put hashtag norway on everything in germany Cause I, my my great gram like great grandma was from norway i think it's great grandma oh wow yeah it was from norway so i said like, maybe that's what it is maybe they they, cool. they know something i don't know but uh <laughs> but uh yeah man i appreciate you uh talking to me i'm gonna do this again and uh don't have to make it yeah. so long you know maybe in another 10 years i'll talk to you know I'll, I'll, I'll be in the i'll be in the I home mean, i got that I got that EP coming out in late June. So see, there you go. We'll have to. I'll put that on the calendar. But but yeah, you we'll said, plug it. But late June is when you're gonna be uh, dropping the EP. Okay, yeah, we'll do yep. that. Yeah, hit up hit up Shauna because she's uh she's doing all my interview booking and stuff now because I got really low administrative skills when it comes to that. So she, <laughs> she takes care of <laughs> she, everything. <laughs> she's a busy lady. I know. Yeah, right. She's handling yeah. a lot of people. Yeah, we've got a lot of interviews. <laughs> man, that's awesome, man. Oh, oh. oh. Yeah. Good luck to the future, and I'll be...